It's episode 621 of the Locked on Rangers podcast. On today's show, I'm breaking down the Rangers sweeping the season series with the Phillies and a trade of Willie Calhoun. All that and more on this episode of Locked on Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, founder and host for all four seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. It is Thursday, June 23rd. Your Rangers are 33 and 35 alone in second place in the American League West, 10 games behind the Astros in the division, and four behind Minnesota for that third wild card spot. Thank y'all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every day. If you're not already, you can go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers, and you can help grow the show by subscribing on YouTube. We passed 900 subscribers on YouTube. We have a little less than a month to hit that goal of 1,000 subscribers by the All-Star Game. We'd really appreciate it if y'all would hit that subscribe button and comment anything below. Now, Let's get into this Rangers game that happened last night, a or yesterday afternoon, I should say, a 4-2 win by the Rangers that felt fairly in control for most of this one. The Rangers did not were not behind for any stretch of this game. The only runs came off of one swing of the bat by Kyle Schwarber, which, you know, will happen. He gets those home runs. John Gray will give up the occasional home run. Not a huge, huge home run problem, but Gray was really, really solid in this one. I'm going to talk a little bit more about him late in this show and how he is finally living up, at, living up to expectations and some one person who I think could help this Rangers starting rotation a little later on. But I want to talk about how great the bullpen was in this one. Matt Moore came in and got an inning in a third and was absolutely nails. Dennis Santana yet again in that eighth inning role. I like him there. I like him as a setup guy, knowing what you're getting out of him, not forcing him to come in with the bases loaded or with runners in scoring position or a crap ton of runners on or just some dangerous high leverage position. He's, he's shown that he could do it at times, but I feel like lately he hasn't been able to strand those inherited runners nearly as much. And him coming in with a clean inning and him having a sub two, sub one and a half ERA at 1.29 at this point, I think that's a little bit better option for him. Got a pair of strikeouts in that eighth inning, got his 12th hold of the season. And Joe Barlow comes in a perfect ninth inning, gets his 13th save of the season. He has been very, very reliable as the Rangers closer and the Rangers were able to get to Zach Wheeler. That is very, very encouraging. He threw 99 pitches in this one. The Rangers made him work. He still got his fair number of strikeouts. He still looked pretty darn dominant at times, but the Rangers were able to manufacture some runs. They went 7 for 8 with runners in scoring position, did leave 7 on base, but some great quality clutch hitting, especially by Brad Miller against his own former team. He was the one who was able to get the Rangers on the board first. He singled um, a very, very perfectly hit single um, into the outfield. I believe it was in right field and they had Josh Smith on first base. He was running on that pitch and showed off his just tremendous wheels. Like I knew he was fast. I didn't know he was that fast. He was off running before like on the pitch, like he was going to steal that base, but Brad Miller smacked it into right field. He scored Jonah Heim and then Josh Smith scored from first base on what amounted to a hit and run. I'm not sure if that was actually the play there, but it was still solid running from him, solid base running for the Rangers, who continue to be one of the most aggressive teams in terms of taking the extra base, stealing bases, and just going for it all out on the base pass. And it's helped them get to some of these wins. And I am just so impressed by this team taking these two games. I knew they needed at least one against this Phillies team. Now they head into the weekend. I'll be talking on tomorrow's episode with uh, Josh Neighbors of Locked On Nationals, previewing that series and seeing how that team is doing outside of Juan Soto, who we all know is still amazing at baseball. But Cole Calhoun... Continue to make me look stupid. Had a, a pair of hits in this one and drove in runs with both of them. Had a, a single um, to center field that scored Corey Seager from third base and gave the Rangers back the lead 
after they tied it up, the Phillies did, with that Kyle Schwarber home run on a 1-0 pitch that scored Alec Bohm as well. Cole Calhoun continued and added to this Rangers lead with a double in the bottom of the fifth inning. Um, he was thrown out at third, probably probably would have have scored on the next uh, the next hit that happened right after him if he wasn't trying to get super aggressive and stretch a double into a triple to be fair to him it was pretty close it was a pretty close call but again Cole Calhoun I know I've I've been a little maybe too critical of him in the past but you know you're old dude you're a little bit older than you have been you're well you're always older than you have whatever you're 34 years old stop trying to steal bases as much stop trying to take that extra base. I know that's what the Rangers, their whole MO is about, but <clears throat> I get not disappointing or not being mad at Adoles Garcia when he's doing it because he's fast and that's what he does. And guys like, you know, Marcus Simeon or I don't know, like Josh Smith or Ezekiel Duran or Leo Tavares, those guys, if they take the extra base and they get thrown out, okay, you would feel comfortable with them doing that again. But if, if Jonah Heim is trying to stretch a single into a double, He's probably the slowest guy on this team, and you might have something to say about that if it's not particularly close. And this one, for a normal a player of like about average speed, I think they probably would have made it to third on this triple. But Cole Calhoun, I'm not. I, I feel like I'm laying into him too much on a guy who had a multi-hit game and scored uh, or drove in uh, half of the Rangers' runs in this one. But still, just, just be a little smarter. That's all I ask. That's all I ask from from Rangers base runners. Be aggressive, but you know. Maybe just be a little bit smarter about them. But the Rangers held the Phillies hitless with runners in scoring position for this entire series. They went 0 for 3 in this one, had an 0 for in the last game as well. Some really, really great pitching in clutch spots by this Rangers pitching staff, John Gray, with a pretty great day, five and two thirds inning, five strikeouts in this one, and only one walk, four hits. Love to see it. Limited the base runners. Did allow those two runs on Homer, but. Again, it's Kyle Schwaber. He's going to hit some bombs. He's going to get to you. It happens. It's not that big a deal. But he was able to limit Bryce Harper to just the one hit and the walk and also struck him out as well. Pretty solid work by this Rangers pitching staff. Thankfully, they didn't have Bryce Harper in the last game. Otherwise, that might have been a little bit closer of a contest. But again, the Rangers absolutely shellacked them in a 7 to nothing win the day before. So the Rangers needed these two wins. They had just come off two pretty embarrassing losses in Detroit in a series they should have at least won if not swept and now they have a chance to go in and finish the month of June on an eight game winning streak it's not that completely out of the realm of possibilities I know Kansas City is kind of apparently on one um in terms of giving the Angels everything they could handle in their most recent series it took Shohei Otani going eight innings and setting a career high for strikeouts to finally eight shutout innings and setting a career high in strikeouts to finally get the win against those guys even after yesterday he had a career high eight RBIs with a pair of home runs including both of them I think were three run shots um, and one of them tied up the game in the ninth inning to send it to extras but wasn't able to get the job done against those Royals. But it's still not a great Royals team. The Rangers should win both of these next series, even though the last series of the month is in Kansas City against the Royals team, who is apparently being quite annoying. Coming up, I'm going to talk about this Willie Calhoun trade, what the Rangers got back, and a little bit summarizing his time here, and what the Rangers should expect from the guy who they got from the Giants. But first, this episode is brought to you by Blue Nile. Whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, find joy as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. Whether you're, you know, they've got all kinds of different things. Blue Nile has simple online tools with diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft the perfect engagement ring. Each ring is one of a kind. If you're looking for jewelry and you're having trouble choosing what you want, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24 7 you can talk to them on the phone or you can just chat with them you can make every moment sparkle with jewelry from blue nile.com and locked on rangers listeners get 50 dollars off purchases of 500 dollars or more this podcast exclusive includes engagement use code locked on that's code locked on for $50 off purchase of $500 or more. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. 
One NBA, one live NBA draft show is not enough for Locked On. The entire NBA channel is going live on NBA draft night. So if you have a favorite NBA team like the Mavericks, go check out the Locked On Mavericks boys. They're doing great work constantly. You know, you can make sure to subscribe to their Locked On YouTube channel so you get notified when they go live on NBA draft night. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this game before I get into some of the Willie Calhoun trade. I need to talk about Corey Seager, who has extended his on-base streak to 12 straight games. The guy has been absolutely on fire the last two weeks in those 12 games. He has reached base in every single one of them. He's got a slash line of 289, 377 on base, and slugging 622. That is an OPS of exactly one thousand he has four home runs in the last two weeks and two or three doubles excuse me seven walks to nine strikeouts that that's about the slash line that i was kind of expecting the slugging is a little bit higher than i expected he's been hitting the ball harder and more home runs this year than he has in the past and then i kind of expected him to but that's great but that kind of on base in the 370s that's where you want it he is a great great on base guy um Usually a pretty high batting average guy, the 289. That's about where I'd think it'd be. If you look at the last seven days in six games, he's got two home runs, two doubles, five walks to five strikeouts, slash line of 368, 500 on base, slugging 790. That is a 1290 OPS in the last week. The guy has been killing it lately. He's been on base every single game since the start of that White Sox series. He has been an instigator, a catalyst. Sometimes he's only reached base once, but in most of those games, I believe he's reached base multiple times, has a bunch of extra base hits in that time span, and uh, starting to see more doubles for him. You like to see that he is a big, big doubles guy. Um, usually it hits quite a few. I believe his career high is somewhere in the uh, 40s for where he has been. But he's consistently a pretty high doubles guy. Yeah, 44 doubles is his career high. He set that in 2019 when he only had 19 home runs in 134 games. Had 40 doubles. His rookie year had 33. The next year, both those years, he was all-stars. 22 last year in 95 games. Big doubles guy. Also becoming a even bigger home run guy. Last year, he had 16 home runs in 95 games. He's at 66 games on the year right now. He's at 15. He is absolutely going to blow last year's home run totals out of the water. He has been healthy for the Rangers. That has been a huge, huge plus. And he is starting, starting to look like, finally, that guy that the Rangers shelled out a bunch of money for. I know it wasn't the best start for him. I mean, the batting average was really great for the first, like, two weeks. Then he kind of fell into a little bit of a hole. The home runs have been fairly consistent, but some of the other stuff, the expected numbers show that eventually all that stuff is going to work out in the wash, and he is going to get closer to those career numbers, if not bettering them. The stuff from Donnie Ecker um, has been, offensively, it's been kind of hit and miss so far, but it's starting to look more hit, more fiery, more of the guys are hitting better and better. Need that to start working on Mitch Garver. Really need your DH only guy to be a big, big power bat in the middle of your lineup, especially since he's shown that he can do it. Just got to keep him healthy, keep him in the lineup more consistently. Honestly, if he's going to be your everyday DH, he probably needs to play a little bit more like every day as opposed to one game in a two game series when you have off days on either side of it. I don't really know what the deal is there. He is still just coming back from COVID, but I would like to see his bat in the lineup more often and I would like it to be more productive please and thank you very much. Now let's look a little bit at this Willie Calhoun trade. The Rangers announced today right before I started recording this. So instead of me, you know, recording a podcast and immediately something dropping right after it, this time I waited until the, I knew something was going to happen. I had a feeling in my bones. So I waited until later in the afternoon to record this podcast. And lo and behold, it happened. The Rangers traded Willie Calhoun in cash considerations to the San Francisco Giants for outfielder Steven Duggar. Now, who is this guy? He is a left-handed outfielder who plays all three positions. He was described by Ben, the host of Locked on Giants, as a gazelle. So that's nice. It's nice to have a gazelle in the outfield. He is kind of a fourth outfield type of guy. Last year had a 1.2 war season, had a career year offensively. He is kind of of a little bit the Eli White model of the, this guy can play some really good defense. He can be a solid fourth outfielder type, um, but can he hit? That is the question. Last year in 2021, he played in 107 games. As a 27-year-old, he is 28 this year. Um, 
in just under 300 plate appearances last year. He had a slash line of 257 on base, 330, slugging 437. That's a 767 OPS. Had, uh, where we go? Five triples, which, again, he probably won't have that many triples because he's not playing uh, in the Giants' huge, huge triples park, but did have 14 doubles and eight home runs, seven stolen bases, and was not caught stealing. Um, hasn't been caught stealing in the last three years, actually, at the big league level. Went um, perfect one for one in 2020, 7 and 0 in 2021, and this year so far he is 4 and 0. The reason the Giants are trading him is because they have a lot of really good baseball players. They have a lot of really good left-handed outfielders, so there's not really room on their 40 man for him. The Rangers have made room for him on their 40 man by uh, knocking Spencer Patton, the reliever, who is in AAA, off of their 40-man roster. But I do believe that he has options. He's just getting back from a 60-day IL stint. He had an oblique injury, so he is healthy now. But the Rangers are probably going to keep him in AAA. They might be able to bring him up as as what they wanted Steel Walker to do and what they have wanted some of their other kind of fourth outfielders while Eli White is uh, on the injured list for at least a while. Might be able to do a little bit better than Zach Rex has done. Rex has an OPS of 559 so far this year. Uh, Steel Walker played in five games, had an OPS of 473. Maybe this guy can actually hit at a semi-competent level. Just about a 700 OPS. That's about what you're expecting from a fourth outfielder type. Not a whole lot expected from him. Can come in and play those outfield positions pretty well. Very good defender, very fast, um, and very dangerous on the base pass. So, <sighs> happy trails to Willie Calhoun. Really, really sad to see him go. Uh, coming up, I'm going to look a little bit at his Rangers tenure and what might have been. And also, about how... Good John Gray has been as of late, and one Rangers prospect I think could be most likely to make this starting pitching rotation by the end of the year, and it's not the one that we thought of at the beginning of the year. But first, this episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because I didn't have time for all these different supplements. I wanted better gut health, more energy, and an optimized immune system. I hated taking all these pills and supplements, but this one actually tastes really great, and I wanted something like that to try it out. So... What is this stuff? It's one delicious scoop of AG1. You're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day off right. The special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All these things that everyone wants to get better at, AG has got you covered. And they have got so many different five-star reviews, over 7,000 five-star reviews. They're recommended by pro athletes, just like myself, uh, definitely a pro athlete and trusted by leading health experts as well. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every single day. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you one year of one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now, let's look a little bit at Willie Calhoun's career with the Rangers. It ended in a bad way a really bad way, and a really frustrating way. He's a guy who I said many times has been the unluckiest player in all of Major League Baseball over the last five years. Every time he was about to break out, he would get hurt, or some jerk pitcher would hit him with a 95-mile-an-hour and and break a bone either in his face or in his arm, which is just not kind. Stop doing that, pitchers. And, you know, when he goes to San Francisco, also pitchers over there, Please stop doing it. He is not going to have to be on their 40-man roster. So because the Rangers designated him for assignment, he cleared waivers and nobody picked him up, which, again, I was super, super surprised about. In Round Rock, he played 21 games, 91 played appearances, had a slash line of 217, 264, and slugged 410. Did have five home runs in that span, but just was not doing the things the Rangers wanted him to do. It was really frustrating watching what he, the, the advanced numbers saying that he was getting super, super unlucky. His regular numbers on the season were quite terrible, but he's a guy who's had a lot, a lot of potential. 18 games at the big league level, 53 plate appearances, a 556 OPS, was walking, was not striking out, and uh, was hitting the ball really hard. 
but just was not able to get those results that the Rangers wanted to see. And he started going back a little bit to his old habits. And I think they were way too quick to cut bait with him. But at that point, they just really, really needed something. His max exit velocity was in the 70th percentile of all of Major League Baseball. He was not swinging and missing. He was not chasing pitches. He was doing everything the Rangers wanted. And the results weren't coming. And he switched it up for just a little bit. And they thought, okay, yeah, let's send you back down to the minors. Then he made the mistake of running his mouth off and saying, I think it's about time for a trade. I think it's it's done. I think my time here is over. I I don't like this hitting staff, and I don't think they're listening to my needs. And that was pretty much the nail, the second nail in the coffin. It was just kind of time to go, which is a real, real bummer. I always liked this kid, had a lot of moxie, did everything the Rangers asked him to do. And it just never really worked out for him here. And I'm super, super bummed to see him go. I do think he needed a change of scenery. And I really do think that he's genuinely going to be a really darn good Major League player. And I think it sucks that all the Rangers got for him was a fourth outfielder. But this was kind of about the best case scenario. A half-decent fourth outfielder and just some value. Because that's he had basically no trade value, which sucks to say. He is a guy who has shown some potential his best year. In Texas, he had, had some good seasons. He had shown some some real promise in Texas. Had a year, um, 83 games in 2019 when he was 24 years old. Um, 337 plate appearances. He had 21 home runs in that span, 14 doubles, um, a slash line of 269, 323, slugged 524. That's an OPS just under 850. And then he got hurt with the hamstring injury in Kansas City, and everything kind of went to crap from there. In 2020, we all know what happened there. He got hit in the face with a fastball, missed most was was going to miss the entirety of the season, or at least the first like three months, I should say, of the season. Then COVID hit. It was like, oh, he'll be ready for opening day. Then he has a hamstring injury. Then he comes back, and then he gets hit in the arm with a fastball. Doesn't do well when he's up in 2020. In 2021. Um, just was not great for the Rangers. I actually actually believe he might have gotten hit in the arm and broken an arm there in 2021, getting all the times that he got hurt mixed up because there were so many of them. Because like I said, he's been super, super unlucky. 75 games in 2021, an OPS under 700. He's got six seasons worth of the majors, 250 plus games, an OPS of 707. And it's just not quite good enough. It's just not good enough to be a DH only guy. I still think he was a passable defensive left fielder, better than Brad Miller out there, better better than some of these other guys. And it just didn't quite work out with Willie. And that's a huge, huge bummer. But what's not a bummer is John freaking Gray outdoing a guy who probably should have won the Cy Young Award last year um, through five and two thirds innings. John Gray has been on a tear lately and he is starting to look like the pitcher the Rangers actually thought they would be getting for his season. He's got 12 games under his belt so far in the area of 418. That's not great, but it is getting better. Um, getting a whole lot better, especially in this month of June. His splits for the month of June, this was, I believe, his fifth start in June, and he has been much, much better as of late. And uh, this was just another another game where he has been great in the month of June. I'm stalling because I'm trying to find his splits on Baseball Reference. And there they are, a 264 ERA in five June starts, 30.2 innings, so over six innings per start. We love to see that. Um, 36 strikeouts, so over nine strikeouts per nine innings. Only 10 walks, so about three walks per nine innings. Actually, a little bit less than that since it's a little over 30 innings and exactly 10 walks. Two home runs in the month. Um, only 21 hits, so not allowing a whole lot of base runners on base in this month. We absolutely love to see it. This is the John Gray that the Rangers need. I don't think Martin Perez is going to continue his sub-2 ERA, but I think he's going to continue to be pretty darn good, and I think the Rangers absolutely need to re-sign him to a multi-year deal at the end of this season because some of their pitching prospects are not quite getting up to the big leagues as quickly as expected. I really did think that Cole Wynn would be up at this point. I thought AJ Alexi would not completely implode. I thought he might be at least fighting for one of those spots in the rotation, but uh, so far this year, that has really not been the case. All the guys at AAA, starting pitching-wise, have not been great. Colby Howard has been, well, about what we expected Colby Howard to be. Um, and 
the other starters at the AAA level. Spencer Howard is starting to figure it out just a little bit, but I'm not sure that I quite trust it at this point. I still need to see a little bit more from him, more consistency for me to be like, all right, I trust this guy to get a major league roster spot at this point. But the guy who has been the best pitcher, had the best season for any Rangers pitching prospect, it's been Cole Reagans. It's been the other Cole. And I think that he is going to be the first starting pitcher in this Rangers minor league system to get called up, or at least he is going to be the most deserving to be called up into this major league rotation, maybe hold down that fifth spot. But I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. He just had his second AAA start. So far, he had had 10 starts at the AA level and did very, very well there. Um, right now in AAA, he has been fantastic, just coming off a start where he got through six innings in just 78 pitches. The last start, he when he threw seven innings and only allowed two runs, 81 pitches. 81 pitches through seven innings. That's not any small feat. He has been very, very efficient. His last start, six shutout innings, only two hits, two walks and seven strikeouts. The guy has been nailed so far. He is starting to look like the guy who the Rangers thought they would get before the two Tommy John surgeries. The fact that he's even healthy in pitching is just great. Last year, him getting back on his feet, getting a whole season under his belt, and this year, just completely just dominating hitters. Absolutely dominating hitters. I have loved what I've seen from him so far. I was able to watch him for one start in double-A, Absolutely loved it. The first round pick from 2016 um, out of Tallahassee. Kind of forget that he is a Florida man because he doesn't give off extreme Florida man vibes. But I really, really like what I've seen from him so far. Had a 281 ERA in 10 starts at Frisco in 51 and a third innings and 65 strikeouts. In 13 innings in two games so far at Round Rock, he's got a 138 ERA and has struck out 15 only walked two and allowed one home run and eight hits. The guy has been nails. A 769 whip um, at the AAA level so far. Love what I'm seeing from him. I do think that it's going to take a little bit of time for him to be ready to be called up. These two first starts are very nice, very good. I'm encouraged by them for sure, but I want to see him do it for a little bit longer, and I'm sure the Rangers will too. I think... If he continues like this and it's mid to late July and he's still got an ERA, if he's got an ERA below two or, you know, even like below three or below two and a half, I think that might be a sign of, okay, this guy is ready. He is ready for the big leagues at this point because I think he's going to turn it around a little faster than Cole Wynn. I'm hoping that Cole Wynn can just straight up turn around like right now because if he has like three, four, five good starts in a row, I think Wynn would be called up in a heartbeat, but I don't know necessarily that he will do it. I did say him being the first one of this AAA roster. Spencer Howard has already been up at the big level, so he'd just be calling, being called back up. So I was talking about big league debuts, so I'm giving myself an out there. But Jake Latz has been fine. I don't think that he is going to necessarily have some huge string of starts that is going to um, jump him up a little bit um, higher up in in the standings um, or in the pecking order, I should say, between the other two Coles. It's cool to have the Coles at the same level again. That is very, very fun. But, um, but yeah, Lats has a 524 ERA so far this year in 46 innings, striking out more than he is getting innings pitched, but does have a home run problem, just under two dingers per, per nine innings and walking four and a half per nine innings. That's not necessarily what you want. I think he will figure it out and be some kind of big leaguer. We saw a little bit of him at the big league level. Um, literally just one start, four and two-thirds innings, and only allowed three runs in that one start in an absolute emergency situation back when the Rangers had that big COVID outbreak at the end of last year, but did solid work there, and I think that he has got big league stuff He's just got to cut down on those home runs. I don't necessarily know if he's going to be a starter at that next level, but whatever role he's in, he can provide major league value to this Rangers club. 
You just got to figure out, is he a starter? Is he a long reliever? Is he a late reliever? What does this stuff look like in each of those roles? But Cole Reagans, I think, is definitely a major league starter. I think he's at least a four, if not a three. I mean, he's starting to figure out those third and fourth pitches. The fastball has always been pretty darn good. The changeup has always been absolutely fantastic. One of the best left-handed changeups I have seen from any Rangers prospect in my many years of scouting this Rangers system. If he gets that slider and curveball, down to where there are at least average major league pitches, that's a number three in your rotation, and that is super, super valuable, especially for a guy who had had two Tommy John surgeries consecutively before he even turned, what, 21 years old? That is super encouraging. I have loved what I've seen from him so far this season. Um, Yeah, it was uh, 20 and 21 when he had those surgeries. Actually, he might have been 19 when he had the first one, but still. Absolutely loved what I've seen from him. Very, very encouraged by his development. And I think he is, he's by far having the best uh, season of any Rangers starting pitching prospect so far. I don't necessarily think he still has the highest ceiling. Obviously, lighter, even though he's been, had his struggles at double A. Um, and Owen White has had his struggles um, to start at high A. I think both those guys have higher ceilings. But I think I might trust, um, Cole Reagan's floor to be a little bit higher than Owen White's at this point, which is not something I thought I'd say about a guy with his history. But again, loving what I'm seeing from him, and I don't think he's necessarily going to be called up pretty quickly. But if he keeps this up, it's going to be hard for the Rangers to not put him into that fifth spot in the rotation because they have a question mark at this point, and it's just a matter of time before they figure out who in the heck is going to fill it if it's not Taylor Hearn. Thank y'all so much for listening to today's episode. Um, it is NBA draft night. So like I said, go check out the locked on Mavs, locked on NBA, locked on NBA big board, all kinds of NBA draft coverage. If that is your thing, um, great, great stuff from the people around the network on tomorrow's show. Like I said earlier, I'll be talking with Josh neighbors of locked on nationals about this weekend series against the nationals. And if the Rangers can continue their win streak and if they sweep this series, they will be above 500 for the first time this season. Thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball.